Hello, I'm Tammy Bailey Stanton and I'm going to be taking you through this tutorial on Pediatric Resuscitation Part 3. This is the list of topics that are going to be covered in the course of this lecture. I'm going to give you a moment to have a look at them. We have spent a lot of time in previous tutorials going through resuscitation and cardiac arrest. It's important to understand that resuscitation is a continuum because this helps us identify areas in which we can improve. Early recognition and prevention is a key step in pediatric resuscitation. This is because rapid intervention may well prevent cardiac arrest. The prevention of near arrest and actual cardiac arrest is a fundamental part of patient safety. Prevention depends on a number of factors on timely identification, treatment and referral of children who are clinically deteriorating, implementation of severity of illness scores and rapid response teams may facilitate timely admission to ICU. What we do know is that teams need to be trained in pediatric care and resuscitation. Teams that do train together and practice together do better. There are a number of early warning scores. PUSE stands for Pediatric Early Warning Score and it is a validated severity of illness score. In 2018, a large international randomized control trial called EPOC was undertaken. And EPOC stands for Evaluation Processes of Care and the Outcomes of Children in Hospital. This was a large study involving a number of first world countries. And they used the PUES, so Pediatric Early Warning Score, but they incorporated it into the study by looking at intensive vital sign recording and intensive documentation as part of the study. These children that were included were hospitalized children. And using this bedside PUES, so this bedside pediatric early warning system, they found didn't actually reduce overall mortality. So looking at that, we can ask ourselves, what exactly is the point of using early warning scores? Another kind of early warning score is TUES, which stands for the triage early warning score. These posters may well look very familiar to you because you'll find them in the triage area of most emergency departments. The South African triage score was designed as a combination of warning or danger signs and vital signs. And these are included in our pediatric South African triage score chart. In 2013, there was a large multi-center study that took place in South Africa. This was looking at the revised South African triage scale for children. And it is an integration of clinical discriminators, which are signs and symptoms, derived from the ETAT emergency triage and treatment course designed by the WHO. It also includes documentation of vital signs, which is the early warning score. And they found that a combination of looking for danger signs and including vital signs has proved that this is a very safe and robust triage tool for children. They actually found in this study, which was the validation study, that the tool had a sensitivity of 91% and a negative predictive value of 95%. This was if we were using hospital admission as the marker for urgency. So even though the 2020 ILCOR guidelines do not recommend using PUs or a very fancy system, um, especially if they're looking at an electronic system of recording vitals and early warning scores, we have found in our own setting, which is a resource limited environment, that using a tool like this can actually improve 
our triage. And improving triage means that we rapidly identify children who are at risk and much more likely to need intervention. So it's a valuable tool um, to be used, especially in resource-constrained healthcare settings such as ours. The ILCOR 2020 Pediatric Life Support Task Force recommends improving healthcare provider ability to recognize and intervene for patients with deteriorating illness. They place a higher value on this, being able to recognize and intervene, than the expense incurred to implement a labor-intensive and fancy or expensive electronic physiological surveillance system. There has been an update to the American Heart Association pediatric chain of survival. Both the in-hospital cardiac arrest and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest chain of survival now have six links. The new link is for recovery. This is because there's a focus on continued resuscitation once ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation, has been achieved. post ros care is a vital process in achieving good clinical outcomes. Recovery and return to clinical baseline is our ultimate goal when resuscitating infants and children. With the focus on recovery, post-cardiac arrest care has its own algorithm, which focuses on optimizing ventilation, circulation and hemodynamics and cardiovascular support. It also considers neuroprotection and acting on metabolic derangements. The aim, again, is to make sure that the child returns to baseline. So being able to attend school, play sport, play music, and live an active, healthy life. The American Heart Association has released a post-cardiac arrest checklist for pediatric patients to help us in the post-cardiac arrest phase the Resuscitation Council of Southern Africa has also released a post-cardiac arrest care algorithm. It takes us through the ABCs of post-cardiac arrest care, and it is used for adults and children. The reason I like it is because it takes us through actual targets for oxygenation and ventilation, so looking at targeting oxygen sats of 92 to 98%, and targeting CO2 of 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. I like this algorithm because it includes initial ventilatory settings and an initial inotrope vasopressor administration advice as well. It also includes H's and T's and reminds us to continually assess, manage, and correct these problems in the post-cardiac arrest phase because they may well contribute to ongoing patient instability. Things that require evaluation in the post-cardiac arrest phase are getting a 12-lead ECG for the patient, most likely getting a chest x-ray and ongoing blood gases. Monitoring glucose in the post-cardiac arrest phase is important because we do not want hypoglycemia to further worsen neurological outcome. The algorithm also has advice for targeted temperature management. Right at the bottom in the block marked H, it has a look at neuroprognostication and other evaluation modalities that may be included in the post-cardiac arrest phase. We need to treat and manage seizures aggressively, so starting anticonvulsive therapy and maintenance therapy after loading. EEG monitoring, if it is possible, so in a high-care ICU setting. Getting early CT brain imaging to give us further information as to what is going on. And also to delay prognostication for at least 72 hours after achieving normothermia. I'm going to talk a little bit more about targeted temperature management. Therapeutic hypothermia has been used for many years in the neonatal population, and the evidence in the neonatal group of patients is very good. Whole body or selective head cooling uh, to 33 to 34 degrees Celsius that has begun within six hours of birth and continued for 72 hours has reduced mortality, cerebral palsy, and neurological deficits in survivors. <laughs> 
So targeted temperature management and therapeutic hypothermia in neonates is a great tool. But what about therapeutic hypothermia in the older age group? So in pediatric patients. Unfortunately, the evidence in the pediatric age group is equivocal. Therapeutic hypothermia versus therapeutic normothermia for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and in-hospital cardiac arrest in children has not provided a survival benefit. So these are two big studies, one that was done in 2015 and one that was done in 2017 that were published that found actively cooling the patients didn't have a benefit over making sure that the patients remained normothermic. So what can we take out from these big papers? The main focus is that we need to target normothermia, which is looking at a temperature of 36 to 37.4 or 5. But the main benefit of targeted temperature management is to prevent hyperthermia. Hyperthermia has been found to be associated with much worse neurological outcomes. Also, targeting normothermia is much easier than targeting hyperthermia, especially in resource-restrained environments. Now that we've spoken about pre-cardiac arrest and post-cardiac arrest care, I'm going to look a little bit more at some of the adjuncts to resuscitation. Pretty much all medications for children are based on weight. There's no standard dose like we use for adults. So it's really important to be able to weigh a patient and get their actual weight. But what can we do if they come in cardiac arrest, actively fitting, for example, in status epilepticus, or they're a polytrauma patient and they are restricted because they're on a spine board and they've got C-spine immobilization and we can't actually weigh these children. Then we need to look at length-based assessments of their weight. In America, uh, they'll use a Braslow tape, which is based on a slightly plumper pediatric population. Pauper tape and flipper chart were designed in South Africa and have been well validated um, around the world. And it's a much cheaper system than Braslow tape. Any of you who've worked in an emergency department that sees kids will frequently have come across pediatric boxes that have been prepared for children based on their weight. And these are examples of the peds boxes in my department at Rehima Musa Mother and Child. And we've got most of the equipment that we need packed into each box based on the weight. So if you have a 20 kg patient that arrives based on length, we can whip out the box 15 to 24 kgs. So we don't have to go scratching through drawers looking for the appropriate sized equipment. Also, it's really nice because we have laminated pauper and flipper charts to each of these boxes, which helps us with drug dosing as well. Another really cool tool, which I love, is Pedistat. So if most of us have got access to a smartphone. And Pedistat is an international uh, app that is really cool to use, very easy, that helps with weight assessments, drug doses, equipment um, for pediatric population. EM Guidance is our very own homegrown app um, from South Africa that also has got a number of really cool resources for pediatrics. Most of the hospital and university protocols have been loaded onto this. So EM Guidance also will have pediatric doses, pediatric protocols, and uh, different guidelines uh, for children. So I highly recommend if you have only got two apps that you download on your phone specifically for kids, I would download EM Guidance and I would download Pedistat. Another excellent tool that can be used as an adjunct to resuscitation is emergency point of care ultrasound. The 2020 ILCOR guidelines, however, do not recommend using POCUS as a prognostication tool during cardiac arrest. 
However, we can use uh, ultrasound during cardiac arrest and in the pre and post cardiac arrest phase. Actually, we can use sonar in any unstable pediatric patient to give us a clue. The traditional causes of shock and hypertension that we learn are there's cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, distributive shock, and obstructive shock. So examples of cardiogenic shock will be if there's a myocarditis or acute cardiac failure. Hypovolemia might be due to hemorrhagic shock, loss of blood, for example, in a trauma patient, or in a patient with a severe gastroenteritis, losing fluids. Examples of distributive shock might be septic shock or anaphylaxis um, or even neurogenic shock. Causes of obstructive shock may include a tension pneumothorax and a pericardial tamponade, for example, in a child that has received a stab to the precordium, <laughs> so a stab heart. Whenever you have any patient, be it child or adult, that is in shock, is hypoxemic or has respiratory failure, Ultrasound can be incredibly beneficial in helping you with this diagnosis. The RASH exam is the rapid ultrasound in shock and hypertension. Um, and I've included a link to a really cool video that will help you go through the RASH examination for pediatrics. While studying uh, ultrasound and the use in emergencies, you may have come across uh, the RASH protocol described according to HIMAP, so varying various areas which you need to interrogate with your ultrasound probe. You need to look at the heart, the inferior vena cava, Morrison's pouch and do an EFAST, so that's an extended focused assessment of sonography and trauma. We need to have a look at the aorta and the deep veins. We also need to look at lung sliding and the pleural, uh, the pleura to look for pneumothorax, evidence of a pleural effusion, pneumonia or pulmonary edema. For those of you sonar enthusiasts, I've included the link to the really cool but fairly detailed video which takes you through the pediatric rush exam um, and it's got really nice images, really nice explanation of how to use the rush exam in a pediatric patient and how to use this tool, so the ultrasound, um, as a bedside tool to help us guide our resuscitation, gives us a clue with regards to a diagnosis, potential causes, and helps us guide further therapeutics as well. At the very least, we can use an ultrasound on the precordium during cardiac arrest. We don't want to waste time, so you'll only use it in your 10 second um, pauses where we are doing rhythm checks. You don't want to waste time in cardiac arrest. So you'll only use your 10 second uh, swaps when we're swapping uh, compressors and we're doing a rhythm check. And at the very least, you can have a look to see, is the heart moving or is there complete cardiac standstill? So is it a true asystole or actually is it a PEA, pulsus electrical activity? Is it a true PEA or actually is there some cardiac activity? Um, and that's one of the very first skills that you'll learn uh, during cardiac arrest using an ultrasound. Is there cardiac motion or is there complete cardiac standstill? Now that we've chatted about the adjuncts, or at least some of the adjuncts that might be used during pediatric resuscitation, we're going to have a look at the pediatric bradycardia and pediatric tachycardia algorithms. The pediatric bradycardia uh, algorithm from 2020 hasn't changed very much. We still need to focus on, is the patient stable or unstable? So any pediatric patient that has an acutely altered mental status, so they've got a decreased level of consciousness, there's signs of shock or hypotension, this is an unstable patient. An unstable patient, we need to focus on improving oxygenation and ventilation for the patient. So these patients, we need to make sure that we are opening the airway, assisting with supplemental oxygen or potentially giving uh, positive pressure ventilations whilst hunting for the cause. If bradycardia persists and the heart rate is less than 60, we need to start with CPR. We need to do ongoing chest compressions despite adequate oxygenation and ventilation if the heart rate remains less than 60.
the bradycardia persists, then we need to administer adrenaline. And the same dose of adrenaline for cardiac arrest is for bradycardia. So unstable bradycardia, it's the same dose. Atropine can be considered if the patient has got increased vagal tone. So the patient has had deep suctioning or post-intubation. Um, or if there's a primary AV block. The first drug of choice, however, in pediatric bradycardia is adrenaline. And we need to keep hunting for the most important causes, which might be toxins, for example, medications. Hypothermia and hypoxia are top of the list. So hypothermia, hypoxia, and possibly medications and toxins. This is the 2020 AHA pediatric tachycardia with a pulse algorithm. You'll see it's pretty cool because it combines the algorithms for wide and narrow complex tachycardias in children and consolidates it all into one algorithm, which makes it more similar to the adult algorithm and it's also easier to remember. The most common tachycardia in children is a sinus tachycardia and this algorithm also gives us the rates at which a sinus tachycardia would be considered. The most common dysrhythmia in children is an SVT. Again, this algorithm, much like the bradycardia algorithm, focuses on is this a stable or unstable child. If there's any altered level of consciousness, signs of shock or hypertension, this is an unstable patient. And then we'll need to go down the left-hand side of the algorithm. If none of those features are present, then we can go down the right-hand side of the algorithm for a stable patient. So if you've got a patient that is unstable with a wide complex tachy, we need to treat it as a ventricular tachycardia and do an immediate synchronized cardioversion. If it's a narrow complex tachycardia, we can consider giving adenosine. And if it's not successful, then we can move on to synchronized cardioversion. If we have a stable patient with a wide complex tachycardia, we can consider giving adenosine if it's monomorphic. Um, Otherwise, we need to just phone a friend, phone a senior, and get some expert advice. If it's a narrow complex tachycardia and the patient is stable, then we can consider vagal maneuvers, like in the revert study, um, and then we can try adenosine. The algorithm also includes the dose of adren adenosine, as well as the uh, joules, so the energy settings for synchronized cardioversion. We're now going to go away from the medical causes of cardiac arrest and focus a little bit on one of the leading causes of infant and child death around the world. We're looking at trauma. When someone is bleeding, we need to make a huge effort to stop the bleeding. So we need to compress on the wound, do compressive dressings, potentially use a tourniquet. And sometimes the only way to stop the bleeding is to take them to theater. For example, if they're hemorrhaging internally. So the 2020 ILCO guidelines recommend that in infants and kids with hypertensive hemorrhagic shock after trauma, we need to administer blood products instead of crystalloids. This obviously means that we have to have blood products available. So if you don't have blood products available, we still need to give boluses of fluid 10 to 20 mls per kg um, and for ongoing volume resuscitation, but the best fluid that we can give would be blood. So that would be looking uh, in a hospital setting. While closed chest compressions are not necessarily life-saving in traumatic cardiac arrest, the interventions that are life-saving are external hemorrhage control, so direct pressure control, pressure bandage or tourniquet, applying a pelvic binder, Ensuring adequate oxygenation and ventilation, which may include the placement of an advanced airway. Bilateral chest decompression, either by needle decompression or uh, finger thoracostomies. Establishing intravenous or intraosseous access with the administration of warmed fluid resuscitation. So warmed fluids, crystalloids or blood products preferably and focusing that actual closed chest compressions are not quite as important. The 2020 ILCO guidelines do not have algorithms for traumatic arrest in pediatrics. So I went looking for some algorithms that could be helpful. And I found two in the Emergency Medicine Journal in 2017. 
This one is for blunt traumatic cardiac arrest, and the next one that I'm going to show you is for penetrating traumatic cardiac arrest. In any traumatic cardiac arrest, if there's an obvious medical cause or a probable medical cause, we still need to do fairly standard PULS or APLS resuscitation. But if it's only a trauma arrest, then we need to focus less, deprioritize actual closed chest compressions, and focus on the simultaneous life-saving interventions that I've just mentioned. If we get ROSC, then the patient needs to most likely go for damage control surgery um, and uh, end up in ICU and we'll have imaging. The problem with pediatric blunt trauma arrest is that usually if we don't get ROSC, it's because there's a condition that's not necessarily compatible with life. So the child has completely bled out and we can't replace the blood volume, the circulating blood volume. Or there's a condition, so massive internal hemorrhage, um, or in the retroperitoneum, so there might be a traumatic aortic uh, dissection. If ROSC is not achieved, then we need to look at stopping, uh, stopping the resuscitation. So if there's no improvement in entitled CO2, the child doesn't respond to our interventions, and there's cardiac standstill on the ultrasound. Um, then we do need to consider stopping because a blunt traumatic cardiac arrest has got a very poor prognosis, um, almost 100% uh, uh, unlikely to resuscitate. So this is the algorithm that I found for pediatric penetrating uh, traumatic arrest. And again, it still focuses on the life-saving interventions that we've spoken about. But the one difference between penetrating trauma and blunt trauma is that with penetrating trauma, a thoracotomy is indicated. So getting this child to a trauma surgeon or a pediatric surgeon as quickly as possible um, might be the one thing that actually uh, leads to us saving this patient's life. Um, if there is a cardiac tamponade, then we need the surgeon will decompress the tamponade. They might also clamp the aorta to uh, prevent further hemorrhage internally into the belly. Um, uh, just a note that both of these algorithms are not widely accepted. They're just clinical uh, suggestions, um, but they do at least uh, um, focus on the important things with regards to resuscitation in trauma. So the Pediatric Life Support Task Force from Elcor agreed that it's a good idea to evaluate the evidence addressing the management of seriously injured infants and children, but they agreed that the traumatic cardiopulmonary arrest will, after 2020, remain in the purview of organizations such as the American College of Surgeons via the ATLS uh, courses or other courses like ITLS. Now that we've spoken about trauma and traumatic cardiac arrest in children, we're going to look at one of the more hot topics, and that is fluids and fluid resuscitation in pediatrics. One of the big studies that was released in 2011 is the FEAST trial. And a summary of the FEAST trial essentially is that injudicious use of fluids in children leads to a much worse prognosis and a higher mortality. In early February 2020, the ILCOR Pediatric Life Support Task Force was finalizing their CoStar publication. At this time, the Society of Critical Care Medicine published their Surviving Sepsis Campaign, International Guidelines for the Management of Septic Shock and Sepsis-Associated Organ Dysfunction in Children. So the ILCOR Task Force then cited these recommendations in their 2020 guidelines, specifically looking at fluid management as well as fluid management in septic shock. In infants and children, it is recommended based on the big feast study that if there's no hypertension and no shock, we should not give fluid boluses. If there's a severe febrile illness without hypertension and shock, we must also not give fluid boluses. This is because the FEAST trial showed that injudicious uh, administration of fluids 
led to worsening outcomes specifically because it resulted in fluid overload and pulmonary edema. And these children had much higher mortalities. The current recommendations are if there's hypertension and shock, then fluid boluses can be administered in 10 to 20 mL per kg aliquots. But frequent reassessment needs to be given after each fluid bolus before giving another fluid bolus. So the reassessment that we need to do after each fluid bolus, especially for kitties, we need to have a look at how has the patient responded to the fluid bolus. So we need to look at clinical markers of improved cardiac output. So we need to look at the heart rate response to the fluid bolus, how has the cap refill responded to the fluid bolus, has the level of consciousness improved, if we are with the patient for any length of time, is there urine output that is picking up in response to the fluid? And if we have access to BP measurements, then we need to see how has the BP responded. We also need to look after each fluid bolus for signs of fluid, fluid overload. So we need to listen to the bases of the lungs, but essentially the lungs all over, to listen for crackles, any signs of pulmonary edema, also tachypnea the SATs are going down, we need to look at jugular venous distension and we need to feel the liver to see if hepatomegaly is developing and if there's a gallop rhythm. So if there are any of these signs of fluid overload, then we need to stop giving fluid boluses. If there's improvement in the cardiac output, so clinical markers of cardiac output, then we also need to consider stopping fluid boluses if we've got good response. If we have access to advanced monitoring when available, then we need to implement it as soon as possible. And if we have access to doing serial lactates and serial blood gases to look at our pH and our base excess and our bicarb to see how is our biochemical, um, are there biochemical improvements in response to our fluid boluses. But it's very important that we reassess the child after every single fluid bolus. The last topic that we're touching on is sepsis and septic shock. So sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to an infection. So we know that an infection can be caused by a virus, by a bacterium, by a fungus. So any specific organism that is causing an infection. Um, the infection itself... It is not the same as sepsis. So having an infection, for example, having an upper respiratory tract infection may lead to a fever and a slightly high heart rate. The difference between having an infection and being septic is that there's an abnormal response of the body to this infection. So we might have organ dysfunction in the kidneys. We might have some sort of cardiovascular uh, dysfunction or respiratory dysfunction as a result of the sepsis. According to sepsis 3 definition, septic shock is defined as a subset of sepsis in which particularly profound circulatory, cellular and metabolic abnormalities are associated with a greater risk of mortality than with sepsis alone. It's really tricky because the sepsis 3 definitions of sepsis and septic shock are mostly aimed at adults and the adult population. So we are a little bit stuck when it comes to children. What are the things that we need to look for clinically that needs to make us think maybe this child has sepsis? Looking at kids, we need to hunt for the red flags. So we need to look for a very high temperature, so a temperature of 38.5 and above in most children, a temperature of 38 in oncology patients, or a low temperature, hypothermia, temperature of less than 36. Um, obviously, we need to consider a core temperature when we're doing these, but a very hot or a very cold child, we need to worry about sepsis. If there's increased respiratory rate, tachypnea or work of breathing, we also need to be considering could there be sepsis. We need to have a look at the heart rate, and if it is inappropriately high, 
for the child in front of us, we need to be concerned. It's important to remember that vital signs at different ages um, uh, are not the same. So we need to have a look at a PUSE chart, so a pediatric early warning chart, to see what are the normal ranges or the values uh, for that age group. If the kiddo has a prolonged capillary refill time, so if it's three or more seconds, especially if it's very slow, um, also if it's very brisk, less than one second, so like a flash capillary refill, we need to be concerned about sepsis. We also need to have a very high index of suspicion in uh, certain age groups or certain groups that are even higher risk for getting infection. So uh, small infants and neonates, um, patients who've got chronic disease, patients that have had recent surgery and immunocompromised children, we need to be particularly mindful that these children could have uh, sepsis. If there's an altered mental state, for example, the child is very sleepy, lethargic or floppy, we need to be concerned, could there be sepsis? Also, if there's a non-blanching purpuric rash, so it looks like bruises, but it's non-blanching, we need to be worried about sepsis. Though these are all red flags that you need to have on your radar when you're handing over the patient at a facility. You need to say, hey doc, or hi sister, I think that this child might be septic. With regards to fluids and sepsis, the most recent guidelines recommend the use of buffered or balanced crystalloids over normal saline. Um, so normal saline is abnormal saline, so we'd rather use ringer's lactate or balsol. Crystalloids are preferred to albumin for resuscitation, and this isn't really relevant in the pre-hospital environment, but it might be in a, in a inter-hospital transport um, or in an in-hospital setting. It is recommended that we do not use starches um, or gelatin, so colloids in sepsis, because so that we will have worse outcomes and a higher mortality in these patients. When we have a septic child, we need to do frequent clinical reassessments, just like what we discussed in one of the previous slides. If we're in a resource-limited setting and we don't have access to ICU, if we're giving fluid boluses in response to hypertension, we cannot give more than 40 mils per kg in total. If we do have access to ICU, so if there's no resource constraints, then we can give 40 to 60 mils per kg in response to hypertension with sepsis. There are bundles of care that we need to give to patients with suspected sepsis. So sepsis 6 is one of the bundles of care that's been described for uh, early management of children with sepsis. So these kiddos, if they need oxygen, we need to give them high flow oxygen. It increases oxygen delivery to the tissues. We need to establish early IV or intraosseous venous access. As soon as possible, we need to take blood cultures and other cultures. So that's obviously done in a hospital environment. If we have access to blood gases, so if you're doing an IHT and you can do uh, serial blood gases, um, that is a good thing to do. We need to measure glucose and do serial glucose measurements. If you can have access to a lactate that's usually on our gas, that's a, a good thing to do. The sooner the better that we give empiric antibiotics. The reason for this, for each one hour that is delayed in the administration of antibiotics after the diagnosis of sepsis or septic shock, the mortality increases by almost 10% per hour. If it's needed, we need to give IV or intraosseous fluids, 10 to 20 ml aliquots as already discussed, preferably a balanced solution and repeated as necessary. Early inotropes or vasopressors are recommended, especially in fluid refractory shock. Um, and senior review or senior discussion as soon as possible to guide the management of this patient. In 2020, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign released two algorithms, and one of them I've included on this slide, showing the initial res resuscitation algorithm for children. So... It includes the sepsis 6, so the bundles of care that we need to do once we are concerned um, and we've diagnosed sepsis or septic shock. In fluid refractory septic shock, uh, 
we need to use adrenaline or no adrenaline if it's available as the initial vasoactive infusion to maintain adequate mean arterial pressures and perfusion to the organs. In fluid refractory septic shock, if adrenaline and noradrenaline are not available, we can consider using dopamine, although for most of us this is not really an option. In septic shock, unresponsive to fluids and requiring vasoactive support, we can consider administration of a stress dose of corticosteroids, for example, hydrocortisone in the region of 1 to 2 milligrams per kg with a maximum dose of 100 milligrams. Hydrocortisone may result in harm and there may be benefits, so that's why it's not on the algorithm as a have to, it's a consideration. It's vital when there's sepsis and septic shock that we need to look at it at source control. So if there is appendicitis causing sepsis, we need to make sure that the child goes to theater. If the child has a septic abscess with surrounding cellulitis, we need to lance the abscess and to surgically control the infection. If it's a pneumonia, then we need to provide ventilatory um, and oxygenation support for the lungs until the infection in the lungs uh, settles. So this is a really cool algorithm um, that has been released in 2020 and I'd recommend that you guys have a look at it. So we've come to the end of pediatric resuscitation part three. We've gone through a couple topics and uh, the things that we've discussed in this TAT is some of the pre-cardiac arrest concerns. For example, the early warning scores, like the pediatric early warning score and triage early warning score. We've looked at post-cardiac arrest care and the post-cardiac arrest algorithm. We've discussed some of the adjuncts to resuscitation, including point of care, emergency ultrasound, We've briefly looked at the bradycardia and tachycardia algorithms for children. We also had a discussion around hemorrhagic shock and traumatic cardiac arrest. And we ended off the tutorial looking at fluids, sepsis and septic shock. This last slide, I've put up a few cool resources for you to check out online, specifically with regards to pediatrics and pediatric emergency medicine. Um, they're all really nice websites, all really nice blogs, and I'd recommend that you check them out.